Natalie Cole, born Natalie Marie Cole, was known as an American singer, songwriter, and actress. She was the daughter of singer and jazz pianist Nat King Cole. Cole rose to her success in the mid-1970s, yet she was born into a life of extreme and led a life of extreme. She was born with both the blessing and the burden of her family. Legacy, which had given her both some of the greatest advantages a person might hope for and some of the greatest disadvantages. Cole made many mistakes, and looking back, she drove head first into every black hole she encountered. Cole was born February 6, 1950, in Los Angeles, California. Her parents were Nat King Cole and Maria Cole. Cole's father was from Montgomery, Alabama. He was a jazz singer and pianist in the 1940s. Cole's mother was also an American jazz singer. Her mother was from Hancock Park District of Los Angeles. Cole was the firstborn of her four siblings. Carol, known as Cookie, was adopted by her parents at the age of four after the passing of Carol's mother. Carol's mother was Cole's mother's sister. Cole grew up in a big mansion in Hancock Park, one of the most exclusive neighborhoods in LA. Her parents were the only blacks in the neighborhood and was not welcome. After a lot of legal maneuvering, her family moved into the neighborhood in 1948, two years before Cole was born. Cole's mother traveled with her dad and they would be gone for weeks and even months. So her aunt Charlotte, known as Baba, moved to Los Angeles to help raise Cole and Cookie. She was like a mother to them both. Cookie and Cole were raised as sisters. Cole had a happy childhood. She loved to play the piano as a child. In her home library, she would browse through her child craft books. The poetry volumes were her favorite. She would sit at a piano and take the poems in child craft book to make a melody. That was when her desire to write a song started. Cole's basic knowledge of performing came from her dad. Singing was not her dream as a child. Cole also loved being outdoors as a child and was always a daredevil and a prankster. Cole's parents grew up different. Cole's dad grew up poor. His father was a reverend and his mother was a preacher's wife. He had three brothers and two sisters. His dad moved his family to Chicago in the 1920s. Cole's mother was a beautiful woman of elegance and refinement. Her mother grew up in Hancock Park, District of Los Angeles, one of the most exclusive neighborhoods, and had two sisters. Her dad was a dark-skinned man without a lot of education who could sing and play the piano. Her dad married above his means, and her mother's family would never let Cole's dad forget, except for her aunt Baba. That distance between their families caused a lot of dif dysfunction in her parents' marriage and made it awkward, awkward for Cole and her siblings. In July of 1959, Cole's parents adopted a baby boy named Nathaniel Kelly Cole. They called him Cowley. In the early 1960s, her father became one of the most popular singers in his day. Cole's and her family traveled grand style. Their family was the, always the fascination of the black press. Education was a top priority, so they could not travel during school. When Cole's mother traveled with her dad, that may have saved their marriage, but was painful for Cole and her siblings. And early in 1961, at the age of 38, Cole's mother found out she was pregnant with twins, Casey, and Timeline Cole were born September 26, 1961. During 1961, Cole traveled and performed a couple of shows with her dad. As Cole got older, she did not feel like she had an, an identity, and because she was Night King Cole's daughter, she did not know who she could trust. 
in September of 1964 at the age of 15. Cole's dad took her to register for her freshman year at the Northfield Prep School for Girls in Northfield, Massachusetts. There were no black teachers and not many black girls. She did not think that was a big deal at the time because her dad never saw color. When Cole went home for Christmas that year, she learned that her dad had lung cancer and was not going to make it. After Christmas break, Cole returned back to Northfield, and then that following year, on February 15, 1965, Cole's dad passed away. Cole felt her family was never the same and was falling apart after his passing. Cole returned back to Northfield, but there were just too many hurdles. So after her second year ended at Northfield, Cole went back to Los Angeles. Cole got into trouble in Los Angeles and her mother made her get a job. She worked in the summer as a switchboard operator and and a receptionist at a sanitarium. Although the job was a punishment, it turned out to be a good thing for Cole. That September, Cole moved back to Los Angeles and enrolled at the Buckley School in Sherman Oaks. Buckley was one of the most prestigious prep schools in Los Angeles area. Cole was glad to be back in Los Angeles. Cole started dating a handsome young black man named Eric. Eric was Cole's first study boyfriend. Cole and Eric had lots of fun together. Eric was a good student and an inspiration. They would study together and at that time they would take uppers together to keep them up while studying. In 1967, her junior year at Buckley, smoking a joint of marijuana was not really considered a big deal to the younger crowd. Buckley is where Cole discovered marijuana. After graduating from Buckley, she and her mother chose the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. UMass was rather progressive and even a bit confrontational. Cole not growing up around many blacks, she never had to deal with her blackness and did not learn how unique her upbringing was until 1969 once she went to college. Color did not matter to her dad. Cole did not have many black friends growing up. Privilege had kept her away from the aspects of black life in the United States. She learned about her blackness from a good from a good point of view. Cole started hanging out with the other black students. Her second year of college, Cole met a young man named Jimmy. Jimmy became her second study boyfriend. He made her feel good and helped her to overcome some of her emotional baggage. She worked briefly with the Black Panthers with their breakfast program for the children and with the early education program for economically deprived children. She was very proud to be a part of that university and academic institution. Cole loved to party and partied a lot with Jimmy. They smoked marijuana and drank Harvey Wall Bangers, which was orange juice, vodka, and Galliana liquor that was popular at that time. Her sophomore year, she was encouraged, encouraged to run for Carnival Queen, an event like the Rose Parade. The Queen presides over the parade. Cole was first runner up and the first black girl to place in the Carnival Queen. Soon a friend of Cole's named Eddie Peterson had a group he was singing with and asked Cole if she would practice with the band. She started singing with the group and did such an amazing job that it was the first time anyone had suggested that she make a career out of singing music. Being that education was a top priority, she was worried what her mother would think. Cole transferred to USC for the beginning of her junior year. She did not like USC because USC was born. Cole returned back to UMass in the summer of 1971. She made some extra money singing with the band at the pub until school started in the fall. 
the band was called Black Magic. One black girl and four white boys. When Cole got back to UMass as a senior, she got into LSD. Early in 1972, Black Magic became a fixture at the pub and the money they made, they would split evenly. Cole always felt getting into drugs was a combination of unresolved issues in her life. While working at the pub with Black Magic, she met her first agent. His name was Dick Booth. By the time she received her degree, he had jobs lined up for her. She was booked around New England, mostly in Connecticut and Massachusetts. Scared to tell her mother she wanted to sing and not go to grad school, at cold surprise, her mother told her if she is going to do this, she could not be with just anybody. Cole parted ways with Dick Booth, and in, the late, and in late 1972, her mother took her to New York to a creative management agency. Cole was connected with one of the top booking agents named Steve Cooper. Steve got her booked for a lot of shows, and she was selling out shows every time. Only two years after college, Cole got her first record deal in 1974. Cole was constantly booked and needed a manager to guide her career. Kevin Hunter became Cole's manager. At the time, Cole was still doing uppers and downers. After her success at the pub, she was a local celebrity in her own right, Natalie Cole, and not just the daughter of Nat King Cole. Things were going good for Cole. She lived in a beautiful garden apartment in Springfield, Massachusetts. She had a boyfriend at the time named Ricky. Ricky was kind of a bad guy and Cole had a little bad in her too. One day Ricky and his friends were doing heroin and she asked to try it and she liked it. Eventually Cole was hooked. She worked a lot and her heroin, and her heroin use was increasing. Cole wanted to go to the next level. She went from snorting to skin popping. She administered her own shots. She went from skin popping once a day to four times a day over time. Cole did learn how to shoot up. Ricky had showed cool Cole how to shoot up and she was a very creative junkie. She even hid her addiction from her mother. Her mother's attention was on her new life, so that gave Cole the opportunity to hide it from her mother. After a physical altercation with Ricky, their relationship ended. By this time, Cole was so addicted that she got behind on rent and was evicted. Cole lost everything and had to move into a small one-room efficiency apartment. Cole's addiction, addiction still increasing, she met a guy named Tim and his wife. While at their home, she got she had shot some brown heroin. She was in the bathroom, and before she knew it, she passed out. Tim and his wife saved her life that day. After meeting new friends, Cole no longer saw her old friends. Cole got into check fraud and started making checks in small amounts like $300 to $500. She had the machine in her house. Cole was a felon by day and a singer by night. Cole was making this addition thing work until her first prestigious show at a nightclub called Shepherds at Drake Hotel in Manhattan. Cole was on stage singing and passed out. Shepherds fired her on the spot. Having only $20, Cole had to choose between putting gas in her car or buy drugs. Cole put the gas in her car and drove back to Springfield and suffered horrible withdrawals. Once back in Springfield, a detective knocks on her door. They were after the check fraud ring and various drug dealers. Cole had to give her fingerprints and was scared to death. She was not charged. After the disaster at Shepherds, Kevin Hunter knew Cole was having problems and they got out of Springfield the next day and went back to New York. Cole was arrested for several violations in a short time and no matter what she wanted to continue to get high. Cole still getting a lot of gigs was singing Aretha Franklin songs and Kevin suggested she sounded too much like Aretha. 
That was a compliment to Cole because she loved Aretha Franklin. Catherine wanted Cole to establish her own unique sound and heroin was totally off limits. Cole stayed clean for a few weeks but was right back into it. While Catherine was working to get Cole a recording contract, he got in touch with Marvin Yancey and Chuck Jackson. After meeting with them that day, after meeting with them that day changed Natalie's life. While she continued working in between gigs and with Marvin and Chuck, they made four demos and Capitol Records were their biggest interest. Cole was signed in with Capitol. Cole's addiction was manageable. On her birthday, February 6, 1975, Cole was in Toronto for his show and she received a knock from the motel door. When Cole opened the door, the police rushed in and tore the room up until they found a $25 bag of heroin along with her paraphernalia. Cole was arrested and, inter and interrogated. Cole could not believe they thought she was a big time drug dealer and kept asking her where the kilos were. Cole could not tell them anything because she did not know anything. Cole ended up posting bond that night. Cole received three months probation, probation and could not leave Toronto while on probation. Cole had an attorney and the story never made it to the States. Cole continued to work gigs but had to crisscross cross in Canada from one end to the other. They worked mostly every day while she was stranded on probation. Cole left Canada the day she was released from probation. Cole moved back to Chicago and stayed with her aunt back. Marvin and Chuck were happy to see her back. They continued working on the album and she had finally found her true voice. After finishing the album, Inseparable, they were all excited and celebrated. That was the best Cole had felt in a long time. The day after they celebrated, Marvin asked Cole out on a date. Marvin took her to a church on Chicago's South Side. That is when Cole found out that he was a he was Reverend Marvin Yancey. Marvin, not knowing how Cole would feel, he waited until after the album to tell her. Their relationship developed right then and there. In 1975, her hit, This Will Be, started to take off and was rising the Billboard charts. February of 1975, she won a Grammy for Best R&B Female Category. That was a bittersweet moment for Cole. After the Grammys, Cole's career rose to another level. She was becoming Natalie Cole in her own right. Natalie's second album, Natalie Went Gold. Within a month, she was awarded a third Grammy for her song, Sophisticated Lady. The first cut, Mr. Melody on Natalie, became the number one hit single. Continuing working gigs and traveling to different countries, in June of 1976, she met Shaka Khan on the television show Tokyo Music Festival in Japan. She met Shaka's drummer and producer, Andre Fisher. Andre asked Cole on a date, but she was in love with Marvin and did not go out with Andre. Marvin and Cole had a complicated relationship, and the songs on her album said it all on her album, Unpredictable. They loved one another, but could not get it together. After a show in the summer of 1976, Cole caught a plane to Chicago to see Marvin face to face. She had a whole speech prepared, but to her surprise, he took her into his arms and asked her to marry him. Of course, she said yes. Three days later, at the spur of the moment, they decided to go and just do it. They said forget a big wedding. On July 30th, 1976, they took their vows in the back seat of Reverend Reynolds Cadillac while he read the Bible in the front seat. Their marriage was a secret for about six months. On Cole's 27th birthday, February 6th, 1977, they married at Marvin's church and had it, and the reception was at the Ritz in downtown Chicago. 
A few weeks later, they had another reception in Los Angeles at the Beverly Hills Hotel. Cole continued to perform to the end of 1976. In January of 1977, Cole found out she was pregnant and she was ecstatic. Living in Benedict Canyon in Beverly Hills, she worked until her seventh month. While pregnant, she recorded her fourth album called Thankful. Thankful went platinum twice and was the first female artist to go platinum twice. That same year, Our Love, the second single out, was her fifth consecutive number one single. She also recorded the album Natalie Live. On October 14, 1977, Cole's son, Robert Adam Yancey, was born, and her, her whole entire family was there. Cole hired a nanny named Drew McRae. She became a cornerstone in their lives. She helped raise her son and even kept Cole on track. In April of 1978, Cole had her first musical special. In October of 1978, she sold out the Metropolitan Opera House and the first black female artist to ever sing there. In February of 1979, she was presented a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Not long after, Capitol thought they could get Cole to become a disco girl. She recorded an album, I Love You So. The album did not do bad from a sales point of view but was not as successful as her previous albums. As time went on, things that she cherished and thought was important began to slip away. She started snorting cocaine at a party she was invited to. At a very low point in her life, she turned Marvin on to it. That was a new experience for Marvin. He may have smoked a joint before, but never anything like cocaine. They went from experiencing at parties to bringing it into their homes. They lost touch with their old friends and even began freebasing. With rumors going around about her drug use, she denied them all. Her marriage was crashing down. And on New Year's Eve of 1980, Marvin was served divorce papers in Chicago. There was no argument and they, they were divorced within a year. If Cole had to regret anything in her life, she regretted divorcing Marvin. Cole felt they were 28 years old, successful, rich, and just dumb. Between 1980 and 1983, Cole's career gradually went down because of her drug use. May 15, 1980, her eighth album, Don't Look Back, was released. The album was not a bad album, but she knew, in Capitol's eyes, she was going down. During this time, she was asked to be a spokeswoman for Posner and did her first TV commercial with them. Posner was a line of beauty products for black women. Still battling her addiction, God was constantly giving her signs. Cole almost lost her life to a fire at the Las Vegas Hilton, February of 1981. In June of 1981, Cole stepped in at the last minute to perform the Cool Jazz Fest in San Diego. She gave a strong performance, but she knew she needed to get it together. In July of 1982, she was headlining theaters in Atlantic City, and in the middle of the show, she lost her voice. That had never happened before. After seeing her doctor, it was discovered she had nodules on her vocal cords that would have to be removed surgically. During this time, she learned Marvin was in a cardiac unit in a Chicago hospital. Cole caught the first plane to Chicago. Even though they were apart for two years, they still loved each other. They worked on two more albums together, and he frequently would visit Robbie. They gradually became better friends. Marvin got a hold of his drug problem, but she had not. Marvin urged Cole to get help, but she only dug her heels deeper. Cole had stopped paying attention to everything but herself and almost lost her son. Cole was grateful for Drew, her nanny, or things could have been worse. Cole sank to so many lows. The first tr truly public revelation of her addiction 
was when her mother petitioned the Los Angeles Superior Court for conservatorship over her finances. Cole did not put up a fight. Her mother wanted to protect her and was afraid she would be taken advantage of with her addiction like her dad was. Cole's mom was right. And after the conservatorship, she learned after earning millions recording and performing, the most the court, court auditor could find was $300,000. Cole's accountant at the time could not explain where the money went, and it, and it did not all go to drugs. Behind the scenes, Cole's mother, sister, brother, and anybody that cared about her was begging her to go to drug rehab. Although Cole did not want to go, she went to get everyone off her back. She hated every minute of it and could not wait to get out to get high. Once Cole got back home, her mother was starting to grasp what was really happening to her and wanted her to clean house so her manager, Kevin Hunter, had to go. Cole's business manager found replacements. Those replacements were Dan Clary and Sherman Bash. Sherman had represented other great performers. Dan met with Cole at her home and could tell she was in trouble, but still believed she had the potential to hit some home runs. On one evening in November of 1983, Dan and Cole's attorney arrived to her home unannounced. They suggested that she get help before she lost her life and they were worried about her. For the first time in years, Cole listened, and after Thanksgiving in 1983, she went to a place called Hazleton in Minnesota, and that changed Cole's life forever. Cole had to make sure she was getting help for herself and not her family or anyone else. Cole had gone from hating Hazleton to scared to leave Hazleton. Cole knew she had to get her life back on track, or she was going to lose everything. Cole was only supposed to stay 30 days, but stayed for six months. Cole graduated from Hazleton on May 16, 1984, after six months in the program. It helped to shape the woman she had become. Cole went home homeless. Her home was sold while she was in the program. She lived with her Aunt Baba for a little while, but knew she needed to get back on her own. With the help of her business team, she soon moved into a townhouse in Studio City, and for the next 10 years, she was a valley girl. They also bought her a car so Cole and her son could get around. In July of 1984, she appeared at the Nuggets, at, I'm sorry, she appeared at the Golden Nugget in downtown Las Vegas. After working years as a headliner, she was back to working in lounges. Cole still had connection with her audience, and although it was less money, she had to do what she had to do. She was determined to be able to provide for her and her son. On March 22, 1985, Cole received a call while in Dallas for a show that Marvin had a stroke. Cole was a mess, and her son seemed to be okay at the time. Cole and her son attended the funeral in Chicago. Even though, Mar even though Marvin had remarried, she continued to think of him as her soulmate. A point came when she realized she had to stand on her own and not depend on other people. She knew her first responsibility had to be her son. Cole returned back to Los Angeles and finished her first sober album, Dangerous. Nothing came big out of that album. Marvin's passing was like a door had closed, but little did she know it was the first of many. Cole began to let lose many people close to her. On March of 1987, Drew, her nanny, passed away, and that was a big impact on her and her son. Cole won a soul training and NAACP Image Award in 1988. Cole had not touched a drug since November 29, 1983 and was approaching her fifth year sober anniversary. May of 1983, she did a television tribute 
tribute to her dad for BBC in London with Johnny Mathis. BBC released the music and album overseas and sold 800,000 copies. In 1987, she recorded an R&B version of her dad's song, When I Fall in Love, for the Everlasting album. Everlasting also had three big hits, went gold, and nominated a Grammy. In 1988, Cole became really depressed and was ready for love. Cole wrote a letter to God, asking for a husband, and put the letter in her Bible. After 10 years of being single, Cole started dating Andrew Fisher, a blast from the past she met in Tokyo in 1976. And about a month later, after dating, he asked her to marry him. He was a producer, drummer, and knew a lot about the industry, and Cole saw that as a plus. She was convinced Andre was the one because she wrote that letter to God and felt God sent him to her. On September 17, 1989, they married. She and Marvin did not have a big wedding, and this time she wanted something more. Her and Andre had at least 100 people or so at the church and at least 600 at the reception. It was a beautiful wedding. Everyone was having a good time and smiling except her mother. Her mother could tell Andre was a loser, but Cole had to find out for herself. On May 28, 1991, Unforgettable With Love was released. The album was dedicated to her dad, and Cole was performing Unforgettable all over the world. It was a love project all summer long. By July of 1991, the album had hit number one on the Billboard charts. It was Cole's hope she could offer her dad's memory something in return for the many gifts he had given her. Um, and by October of 1991, the album had reached number one on jazz and pop charts, and the sales had gone to over two million. On January 8, 1992, it was announced that 11 Grammys for Unforgettable with Love was nominated, and it received three NAACP Image Awards. In 1992, Cole was inducted, I'm sorry, in 1992, Nat King Cole was inducted into the Grammys Hall of Fame. Although this was great for her family, in Cole's opinion, it was about 30 years too late. After the highlight of all of the joy, her marriage was crashing down. Andre was insecure and angry. Cole still was believing he had been sent from God and wanted to try to work it out. They even went to counseling, but Cole found out Andre had a girlfriend and the woman was a secretary that worked in their home for several months. Cole had no problem filing for the divorce after that. In November of that year, Cole filed for a divorce for irreconcilable ir 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 differences. Cole moved on and worked on her album Stardust. The album won a Grammy and Cole said success was her biggest revenge. Once her divorce was final, her life went on without Andre and Cole's continued to work and act. Through all of this, Cole was trying to strengthen her relationship with God. She got closer to who she was and who God was and where he wanted her to be. She knew she was not where she ought to be but thank God she was not where she used to be. Natalie Cole passed away December 31st, 2015 at the age of 65. And if you made it to the end of this video, I want to thank you for watching. And if you liked the video, I ask you to give me a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and hit that bell so you will be notified when I upload another video. Thanks for watching.